Swords are, without a doubt, some of the most fascinating tools humans have ever created. For centuries, they weren't just weapons. They were symbols of power, honor, and innovation. From the battlefields of ancient history to the ceremonial halls of modern times, swords have evolved in design, technique, and purpose. Every step of sword making is carefully designed to improve the strength and durability needed for functional blades or define the aesthetics that collectors admire. Today, modern metallurgy continues to push the boundaries of what swords can do, while others keep traditional processes alive to preserve their authenticity. But here's the question. How does the type of steel influence a sword's use or performance? And is the steel the most important part of a sword blade? Swords are primarily made from steel, an alloy of iron and carbon, with carbon content typically ranging from 0.1% to 2%, giving the steel its strength and hardness. While plain steel relies mainly on its iron-carbon composition, Alloy steel includes additional elements like chromium, manganese, nickel, and others to enhance properties including addition of toughness or corrosion resistance. Strength keeps the blade from bending or warping during heavy use. Hardness ensures a sword maintains a sharp edge over time crucial for cutting competitions and demonstrations where edge retention is key. Toughness is what makes the blade softer and more flexible. It lets the sword absorb impact without snapping, but it may bend, perfect for training or combat with repeated strikes. Striking the right balance between hardness and toughness is crucial, as increasing one often compromises the other. Corrosion resistance protects the blade from rust, ideal for swords used outside or just for display. These four properties are key, and their importance varies depending on the intended use. Some may need to be prioritized over others. This video is brought to you by Swordus, a sword retailer offering over 1,000 replica blades from various cultures and price ranges, all crafted by reputable brands. Of course, metals are just the foundation, and without proper forging, they can't become a functional blade. So, let's move on to see how swords are made. It all begins with selecting the type of steel for the blade and cutting it to the appropriate length. Next, the steel is heated until it's red hot and malleable. Once the steel is malleable, it's shaped by repeatedly hammering it on an anvil to shape and strengthen the blade. Next, the blade undergoes annealing, a process where the unfinished blade is heated to a specific temperature and then allowed to cool at a slow rate. Then hammered again until the swordsmith gets to the desired shape. Now comes hardening. The blade is reheated and rapidly cooled in water or oil, a process called quenching. This makes the blade harder, but also more brittle. That means it is more likely to snap under heavy impact. To address the brittleness, the blade is tempered, gently reheated at a specific temperature and slowly cooled to improve toughness. After forging, the blade is ground to refine its shape, smooth edges, and sharpen it. One of the most fascinating aspects of sword making is the diversity of techniques developed in different cultures. For example, the Japanese sword uses a differential hardening technique where clay is applied to parts of the blade before the hardening process. The sections covered with clay heat slower while the exposed edge heats up quicker. Then it is rapidly cooled off, producing a blade with an extremely hard and sharp edge, while the spine remains softer and more flexible. During durability tests, a differentially hardened blade typically lasts longer. This is because the softer, more flexible spine absorbs impact, delaying breakage. This is just one example showing that, in most cases, the blade's heat treatment is more important than the choice of steel, and this applies to any edge tool. 
Now that you better understand how metallurgy works in combination with sword making, let's explore the different types of steel and their roles. Let's begin with stainless steel swords. Stainless steel is the go-to choice for decorative or ceremonial swords, valued for its shiny appearance and rust resistance. It's perfect for military use and parades, where swords serve as symbols of tradition and must endure humid conditions without being functional. While great for display or ceremonial use, stainless steel swords aren't something you'd show off to true sword enthusiasts. Instead, those made from carbon steels and their close relatives are the ones that truly shine in terms of performance. Carbon steel is often the top choice for many sword makers, as the resulting blades are known for their strength, hardness, and ease of working with, which makes them more affordable. However, their downside is that they require more care and maintenance to keep in good condition, including regular cleaning and oiling to prevent rust. Carbon steel refers to simple steel alloys primarily composed of iron, with carbon as the second most essential element and minimal amounts of other elements. In sword making, the ideal carbon content typically ranges from 0.45% to 0.95% as it responds well to heat treatment like hardening and tempering. The last two digits indicate the carbon percentage. Since higher carbon content increases hardness, it allows for a sharper edge, while lower carbon content offers greater toughness, making the blade more flexible. Next, we discuss spring steel, which is similar to carbon steel, but contains additional silicon, making it more flexible. Spring steel is renowned for its resilience, allowing it to return to its original shape after bending making it ideal for intense training like historical European martial arts or fencing. Another alloy used in high-performance swords is tool steel, which contains added elements that improve hardness. Commonly used in tools like drills and punches for their shock resistance, tool steels excel under extreme conditions. Popular options include T10, a Chinese alloy similar to 1095 high carbon steel, but tougher, and T8, with slightly less carbon. Both are affordable choices for sword making. Premium tool steels like L6 and S7, commonly used in heavy duty tools, offer exceptional durability and impact resistance. However, they are less common in swords due to the difficulty of forging and heat treatment. When forged properly, S7 and L6 Bainite swords are among the most durable blades available. Next, we have the most famous steel, Tamahagane, the traditional steel used in making katanas. Tamahagane is produced by combining and heating two types of iron sand and charcoal in a tatara, a traditional Japanese furnace, to create a steel with high carbon content. The resulting Tamahagane steel goes through a long process to remove impurities and achieve the desired balance of hardness, strength, and toughness. The raw rock-like steel is first heated and hammered into smaller pieces, often referred to as biscuits. These biscuits are carefully stacked together, and the billet is formed through initial folding and hammering until it takes on a better shape. Once the billet is complete, the folding process continues, refining the steel structure through repeated heating and hammering. This labor-intensive process, combined with expert polishing, creates the blade's beautiful surface pattern known as jihada, which includes over 10 types. Today, Tamahagane steel is still mostly used in Japanese swords, primarily in Japan, to create authentic swords that start anywhere from $4,000 up to six figures, depending on the reputation of the swordsmith. Despite its high price tag, Tamahagane is not superior to modern steels in terms of performance. 
The high cost is largely due to the complex traditional production process, premium fittings, and its cultural significance. Next, we move to one of the most debated sword steel types, Wut steel, often referred to as the true Damascus steel. It originated in India and Sri Lanka about 500 BCE. Later, it became widely used and traded in Damascus, Syria, where a thriving weapons industry developed by Arabs. Wut steel is a type of crucible steel that has a high or even ultra-high carbon content. The process of making crucible steel involves melting iron, steel, glass, and other elements in a closed crucible and then heating it up with charcoal in a furnace. This results in a blade with exceptional hardness and a distinctive wavy pattern. And like Tamahagane, Damascus steel can come in different types of patterns. Today, Wut steel swords are quite rare to find. There are also claims that the art of making true Damascus steel is lost and that it has been replaced by the modern Damascus, called pattern-welded Damascus steel. Simply put, Modern Damascus steel is created by forging billets made from stacked layers of different types of steel. This creates a unique layered structure which is then soaked in acid, a process called etching, to bring out the distinctive swirling patterns of dark and light contrasts that have become its hallmark. However, simply stacking different steels isn't enough to achieve the variety of patterns associated with Damascus steel. Swordsmiths use specific techniques during the forging process to create different designs. Some of the most common patterns include twisted Damascus, ladder, raindrop, and feather. This steel is more commonly associated with knives, but the idea that Damascus knives are superior is more of a marketing myth than reality. Now that we're wrapping up the video, it's clear that in the sword industry, especially when it comes to steel, there are many misconceptions and terms used interchangeably. What truly matters, whether it's a sword for practical use, display, or martial arts, is understanding that the forging process and who made the sword often outweighs the steel itself. If you don't have any context about who made the sword, always stick to reputable brands. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and visit Swordus.com, where we offer all kinds of swords from trusted brands.